I can't begin to tell you how delighted and honored we are to welcome Assistant Secretary of State Jim O'Brien, who has the great privilege of overseeing a vast territory of Europe and Eurasia. We are so delighted that you are here. Jim, I have a couple of thank yous very personally to you. Thank you, because you've been Assistant Secretary for three and a half going on four months, uh, came in on October the 5th of last year, and I can't begin to tell you how incredibly important it is to speak publicly right now at this historic and consequential year for the transatlantic relationship. I can tell you every one of my colleagues at GMF feel the press of this history every single day, so thank you. Also thank you as a leader, because I'm a firm believer that leaders must have and set priorities, and they have to communicate those priorities very, very clearly, because at the end of the day, strategy is ultimately about choice and the choices we make on those priorities. And then my last thank you to you is, you are really easy to introduce because you are so well known in this room and so well regarded. I, I, we're setting them high, Jim. We're setting them high, absolutely. Uh, and, and I think as I look at your uh, extraordinary resume, particularly as a public servant, you, I don't know whether you've selected and signed up for them or you've been given them. Some of the toughest assignments in government, sanctions coordinator, you were the first presidential envoy um, for hostage affairs, which has got to be the toughest portfolio, particularly the most emotional portfolio, and presidential advisor for Balkans. You were senior advisor to Secretary Madeleine Albright. You've had some tough assignments. I think maybe this is your toughest assignment and your most important assignment. So again, thank you. We could not be more honored to have you here. And colleagues, with your warm applause, please welcome Jim O'Brien up to the podium. I really appreciate the, that, Heather. Um, just a word of warning to everyone. I'm terrible at reading a carefully prepared script. The good news for you is it means I might actually say something interesting. Um, now, what I want to do today is, is talk about how our work with Europe and in Europe promotes American security, prosperity, and values. And I'm going to talk about that in three priority areas, the war in Ukraine, the whole range of countries around and between Europe and Russia, and our work with Europe on the emerging challenges and global challenges, such as new technologies, uh, migration, and climate. So those are the themes. But before I get into that, I want to thank Heather and the GMF crew. Um, over the last weeks, they have labored through snow, sleet, snow days, um, holidays, rain, to deliver this. So I hope I'm worth all the effort that you and your team have put into it. Um, I also want to thank GMF for the other, its other contributions to the U.S. government. And it starts with Heather, whom I met first when you were managing Central Europe on behalf of the State Department um, 20 years ago. I just came back yesterday from Romania, which is a, a key and crucial ally in supporting um, Ukraine and Ukrainian exports, and in working with the other countries, with Bulgaria, Turkey, and, and others, on supporting security in the Black Sea, as well as contributing to both the EU and, and NATO as well. So job well done from your time um, there. The, um, uh, of course, I have to thank Karen Donfried, uh, whose heels I am trying to fit, uh, Derek Chalet, who has been the department's counselor and kind of spiritual guru the last several years. Uh, Laura Rosenberger from GMF, she's taken on two of the legitimately hardest topics with both um, uh, China and Taiwan, um, and many others from GMF and back and forth with the, the US government. And it matters, and the reason I'm here to talk about our relations with Europe today is because GMF is the embodiment of the transatlantic relationship. Um, and it's a key reminder to us. You know, we're all sure as policymakers that we stand at a unique crossroads, that we're beset by uh, poly crises in a way no one before has been, and that our moment is unique. But GMF stands here as a reminder that we've been in similar situations before. About 80 years ago, Europe was in a desperate situation after World War II. The economies were not moving, institutions were failing, 
Um, and one historian called it the savage peace with millions of people dying or unable to get services. And leaders were starting to create a different kind of politics, one that set aside the sort of short-term competition that had bred four major wars in 100 years for a more collective approach of cooperation that allowed for the prosperity and spread of democracy that we've seen over the last uh, 80 years. That's what GMF was born out of. And we have to remember that vision because what the spirit, the innovation, the values, and the resolve that those leaders show are ones that we need today. And we have them. And I think we can succeed with them. So that brings me now, finally, to 2024. Our challenge this year is to demonstrate that reasonable governments can deliver results on issues that matter to citizens. Otherwise, we cede the political field to people who have cheap slogans and frankly, blame for others. And we know that that leads to conflict, strife, poverty, um, and often war. So what can we deliver on? I'm gonna start by talking about Ukraine, but I wanna note, throughout this, we need to think about how the work we are doing together on Ukraine, on the periphery of Europe, and, and on global issues, we need to think about how it supports, and it's also affected by, the work we do together on issues like Gaza in the Middle East. And so I want to acknowledge that. I'm not going to speak directly to it in the remarks. But throughout, we need to think about what we're doing here and what lessons it holds for what we do elsewhere. So Russia, Ukraine. We're about a, a month away from acknowledging the second um, year of Russia's further invasion, the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And here are sort of basic starting points. Ukrainians continue to choose democracy, equal justice, and a European future, just as they have twice on the Maidan and as they do every day now on the front lines fighting against Russia's aggression. Russia will want to continue its war until it frankly sees the results of our election in November. So we're looking at a long 2024, and we're talking now in the depths of winter. Winter's always dark and hard without any Game of Thrones illusion. Um, we believe Ukraine will be stronger by the end of 2024 and in a better position to determine its, its future. And that future, as President Biden said, is that we're going to help Ukraine win. So that's the, the goal of the strategy. How do we get there? I'm going to start by acknowledging the elephant in the room. We're waiting on further U.S. assistance and on the EU's committed assistance of 50 billion euro by, um, uh, over the next four years. President von der Leyen last week, when Secretary Blinken met her, she was very confident that they will manage to secure their funding. Um, you can read the ups and downs in our process, but I'll say two things. There is huge support in Congress, in both chambers, for supporting Ukraine. The issue is when leaders are ready to put that to a vote. And all I'll say, as the Assistant Secretary for Europe, is every day, People are fighting and dying to protect their security and our security. And I think it's time that we are able to stand by them as we move forward. Now, why do we think that these funds will help Ukraine emerge stronger in 2024 and be victorious? It's because there's a strategy behind this. The money from the EU and the US, along with Ukraine's own tax revenue, all of which goes to pay for the war. They pay for almost two thirds the cost of the war, just with domestic resources. All of those fund a strategy that integrates political, military, um, and economic elements. And I'll talk briefly about these. Now, in addition, once we have this funding in place, we will have reinvigorated the coalition that supports Ukraine. And it's a coalition that has provided more than $100 billion in support to Ukraine on top of the 70 odd billion that the United States has provided. So there's ample burden sharing here in a vigorous uh, coalition that provides both affirmative resources and restrictions on what Russia can do. And let me walk through this. So what we see from Ukraine, militarily, Ukraine will have a disciplined, realistic camp military campaign strategy this year to defeat Russia's offensives and build on what it has done in 2023 especially its remarkable success in securing access through the Black Sea and destabilizing Russia's ability to use Crimea 
as a, a spear pointed up into Ukraine. Now, I'm not going to say more about military strategy in this public forum. Economically, Ukraine is going to continue to rebuild its economy. That provides hope to its people, funds to its treasury, and products that the world desperately needs. And we're seeing progress here. Ukraine's economy grew close to 5% in 2023, um, and it, projections are that it'll be roughly the same, give or take, in 2024. And that has to be supported by reforms and further work, but there are real specific gains that I'll talk about later. So when we talk about U.S. assistance to Ukraine and roughly 8 to 10 billion dollars of this up as part of that assistance. It's an investment. Ukraine is rapidly able to start paying for itself, and we can't look at this as an endless uh, uh, payment program. Politically, Ukraine's going to continue reforms so that it can join Europe. Um, I see Rob Benjamin here. The NDI's recent focus groups show that 85 to 90 percent of Ukrainians are demanding reforms that they are so that they are able to move rapidly into the single market economically and the European Union. That's the commitment Ukraine's leaders have made to us. So these reforms are going to enable Ukraine to make an enormous switch. They're going to trade old Soviet era trading relationships for direct access to one of the most lucrative and integrated markets in the world. And we've seen in the countries that Heather used to engage on behalf of the US government, their incomes trebled over the last 20 years with that kind of access. That's what's at stake for Ukraine. Now, our assistance helping, is helping Ukraine on that path. And I just want to put in a word, we are very mindful of making sure that all US assistance is spent effectively and honestly and directly where it should go. We have a very elaborate program of multiple inspectors general, continual monitoring of how our funding is spent. You know, and I'm happy to go into more detail on that. But, but we feel comfortable that our money will help Ukraine on this path. Now, a word about Russia. What do I think Russia is going to be by the end of next year? And look, Russia's economic ma managers are very talented, and they have helped cover for President Putin up till this point. Russia is managing to import at levels roughly akin to pre-war, which is not the same as importing at levels that a war economy would suggest. Um, but I think their margin for error is slipping. I'm going to say it pains me to say as little about this subject as I am now, but if I go into depth, I won't get to any other topics. So I'm going to say a few things. For the long term, Russia's economy is going to be 6% smaller in two years than it would have been if it had not launched this full-scale invasion. It's lost key parts of the industries that are going to drive the next generation of economic growth. It's lost hundreds of thousands of its most talented, innovative people, and now it's largely dependent on China, North Korea, and Iran for key components that are involved in advanced weaponry and, frankly, an advanced economy. economy. That's not a recipe for growth. In addition, in the last two years, Russia's lost access to its most lucrative markets for its easiest products in the energy. Two-thirds of, of what Russia was exporting is gone from Europe now, and there'll be further reductions as more U.S., Qatari, and other LNG comes available and as the green transition takes root. So Russia has now made a decision to pivot away from part of the wealthy world into something else. We're going to have to think about how we want to deal with that Russia, however the next year or two goes. This revanchist Russia is something that, that the U.S. will need to develop a policy for. That might be a good work for some place like GMF to start thinking about. Now, are sanctions working? This could be a long discussion, but I'm going to offer a couple thoughts. By one estimate, without sanctions, Russia would have $400 billion extra to spend right now. Um, the Kiev School of Economics estimates energy sanctions alone have cost Russia more than $120 billion in the last two years. In addition, the G7 has immobilized more than $300 billion in Russian sovereign assets. Now, we need to tighten our sanctions, and we will. We're going to drive up the costs of Russia's export, exports, and we're going to cu keep cutting its access to key components for weaponry. But let's just think for a moment how much more devastation Russia would be weaking if it had access to those hundreds of billions of dollars that have been denied it. If you just take the um, percentage of, Russia, that Russia, of its own revenue that Russia is spending on the military, they'd be in a position to spend two to three times more just from that money 
they'd spend two to three times more than what the U.S. has provided to Ukraine in security assistance. So when you look at missile attacks every night, when you think about how those missile attacks could be more devastating with more advanced chips and, and weapons in them, and you, you see what the sanctions have done, just think about the, the balance that's there now is there because of the policies of the G7 and a broader coalition of 50 states have taken. And then also pause for a moment to think about Russian healthcare workers, teachers, and others who are seeing their money, the money that would allow for investments in making Russia a better place, now being spent on this imperial dream. Now, more broadly about the way the world views this, the basic tenet of the Helsinki Final Act and the, really the last 80 years, is that each country gets to choose its own security and economic and political partnerships. Russia now is rejecting that, seeking a world of Yalta, where it gets what it wants in the countries it thinks matters to it. It's violating the UN Charter, the Geneva Conventions, and UN Security Council sanctions for which it voted on Iran and North Korea. The world sees that. And I just want to leave you with one thought on this. I know there are, there, there are many conversations about who's winning a discussion with the global south. What I see is nobody's asking for second helpings of what Russia's offering. And every time there's a vote for leadership in an international institution, Russia loses. So just think of the last two years, they've lost senior roles or governing roles in the UNHRC, the ICJ, the IMO, OPCW, UNESCO, the ITU, UNEP, the FAC, FAO, I ICAO, ECOSOC, and Interpol. That's an alphabet soup of international organizations. It's written, written less often in uh, Cyrillic these days. Now, why do we support Ukraine as vigorously as we have? What's in it for the United States? Well, one is we're safer. Ukrainians are fighting, as they say, for democracy, for the European Union, for the UN Charter, for basic principles of the international order of the last 80 years. Those make us safer. They've destroyed more than half the Russian military and are still waiting for the most advanced weaponry. That makes us safer. In addition, if Russia's emboldened, we're going to pay more later. And here I do get frustrated when smart people say they know what Putin will accept. I don't. I know he offers a kind of confusing um, litany of things that he cares about, saying Russia has no borders, saying it's a geopolitical tragedy that any ethnic Russian lives outside a domain governed from Moscow, that um, the Western territories in Poland were a gift from, from Stalin to the Poles. So we're basically asking, do we want to gamble on what he wants? And do we want to gamble with the lives of the people who would live under occupation. And we have seen what occupation means in Bucha, in Mariupol, and elsewhere. And so I think that's not a discussion we want to enter into. I, I think instead, we want to think about what's a benefit now. And here I want to talk about the Black Sea for a minute. Russia tried last summer to get a monopoly on exports through the Black Sea. That's, at under current rates, more than 22% of global grain trade. That hits directly at the global south. What we instead see is that by virtue of the innovation and, and courage of Ukrainians, and with strong support from our partners and allies, particularly those in Romania, Bulgaria, Moldova, and others, Ukraine is now exporting at above pre-war levels, about at or above pre-war levels. It has routes that are secure from Russian intervention. That lowers global prices, secures supplies that are good for the entire world. It also lets Ukraine restart its own industries that sustain employment at home. So what we see is just the increase in Ukrainian exports since, the say, the start of the fourth quarter will add about $25 billion to Ukraine's GDP. It's $5 to $6 billion to its global tax revenue. That's 15% of the gap in Ukraine's budget, just there, just from one step that isn't even complete yet. Now. We're going to have to, going forward, work with our partners and allies in the region to strengthen our Black Sea strategy. Senators Shaheen and Ricketts and others have wisely called for us to have a more focused Black Sea strategy. We have begun that process, and I was just meeting this week to talk about how we strengthen it going forward with Turkey and with the other literal states. And so we'll work on that. 
And at the end of the day, while we look at uh, Putin who thought he was going to divide and weaken NATO, he ends up with a stronger alliance. It is larger by one, and we hope very, very, very soon by two, with Finland and Sweden joining us. But, but even more, defense spending is up. NATO allies are agreeing to effective regional defense plans. So when NATO looks this summer at how it will defend our future at the 75th summit, it will be a stronger, more vibrant body than President Putin expected to see. And I think that is a clear lesson that will help us as we go forward. And we'll emerge from that summit with a clear uh, place for Ukraine that, that is already contributing to our security. Now, second major theme. I want to call it less gray space. So over the last decades, there have been a number of states that may have had a path toward Europe, but no clear prospect of moving toward it. And there were other states that were sort of half between Russia and the US. So this goes from basically the shores of the Caspian and even Central Asia all the way through to the Adriatic. And I just want to touch on a couple of themes here. The first is this is a serious problem for our security, but also for the people of those states. It, it, this gray space allows politicians to flourish who love being just outside the rules, right? They can play all the angles, but not by any of the rules. So we need to change their, their political incentives. And in this context, there are a couple of very good things that are happening. One is the EU's decision to begin accession talks with nine countries is really remarkable to, to intensify its engagement with this range of, of states. So from a US standpoint, we strongly support this. We are linking the instruments we have to be in support of the reforms needed for all these states to find a future as part of the single market and the European Union. So this is a place where our transatlantic work helps to build a wider and stronger community. And in this context, and I'm, I'm just because I'm talking too much already, I'm not going to go through a bunch of specific country issues, but I, I want to emphasize a couple points. In the states of the Western Balkans, so I just met with the six leaders early this week, um, and everyone has some fatigue, frankly, of being promised a path to the EU and then never quite really getting on it. And Brussels has recognized this. And not only is I think there's a different spirit from member states of the EU about how to engage, but they're creating some innovative mechanisms. So the Western Balkans, for example, now is waiting for final approval of the European growth plan for the region. And the key thing about this is in exchange for certain reforms, the states of each state on its own with no veto from another will be able to benefit from participating in parts of the European single market. This is steroids for an economy. It is a thing that can happen soon. So on Monday, with six of the six states leaders, five of them there in the room together, including ones who have other bilateral issues, we committed to working on a set of specific reforms beginning with easier transport of goods and money that will over the course of this year, begin to show practical effects. One of them will cut costs of moving money by about three to 5% on each transaction. That's money in the pockets of people. It facilitates cross-border uh, movements of currency. So we'll work to support the EU as it decides whether to launch the program formally, but it's a really innovative project that'll be available to six of those nine countries. And then there'll be additional work with Georgia, with, with uh, Armenia, with Azerbaijan. Final broad theme I want to talk about has to do with global challenges. So the US and Europe together, and with our other G7 and G10 partners, we need to incorporate our shared values into the new challenges that the world faces. So migration, climate, and I'll just talk briefly about um, emerging technologies. Our view is that economic growth over the next generation is going to be driven by advances in artificial intelligence, biomedical sciences, and the green revolution. Those are the places we all need to invest. A challenge is that virtually any of these areas poses um, real difficulties for existing governance frameworks. So one thing we are trying to do, and we will do through 2024, is work with our colleagues to try to have clear, simple rules of the road 
about how we should invest and use these technologies. So just as one example, next week the Trade and Technology Council will convene in Washington. We're working on aligning approaches to um, governance of artificial intelligence, which will draw on our respective domestic rules and our experiences with new technologies, but hopefully will be a template that will let the rest of the world understand this is how to participate in our markets and how we intend to participate in yours, be open for everyone. Um, and that will develop a whole series of rules. And just as an example, around um, advanced AI systems, we've launched a G7 code of conduct. We have affirmed the Bletchley Declaration about artificial intelligence safety. And we're working toward a UNGA resolution on artificial intelligence to try to have a global framework, simple kind of basic parameters for how we deal with this new technology that might otherwise be very disruptive. Now, these are efforts of building an architecture of the next economy. They're gonna be open to everyone who plays by the rules. They'll encourage competition, they'll encourage innovation, uh, but they should avoid any kind of, of uh, beggar thy neighbor uh, trade dispute because frankly, with our closest colleagues, our supply chains will be more resilient. They will be entwined. We will be competing some places, but also working together to try to build the bedrock of the next economy. And any country that wants to be a part of that process is more than welcome. That's what it means when we say we'll compete, we'll align, we'll invest. And so we're working to do that. Similar themes come up when we talk about climate change or when we talk about uh, migration and other issues that, that matter um, so much for the world. Okay, so I began this by saying, um, we should not believe politicians when we talk about how we are at a unique set of crossroads. <clears throat> but Secretary Blinken did say 2023 was a year of profound tests, and he was right about that. It's a year where we also took significant and even unprecedented steps to share the burden of leadership and to set a way forward as we move to 2024 and, and beyond. We're gonna show progress on these steps during this year, and it'll be a strong foundation for countries as we look to move past the, the, um, the elections that will, will occupy so much of our time this year and the new governments will have a way they can move forward and show citizens that we deliver on the things that matter to them. So with that, Heather, I'm all yours. Uh, Mm -hmm. Sure. You have to be on leashes. No, this is, the, someone said it's like the matrix. We're getting plugged in here, so. Without the right. cranial. That's cranial. right, yeah. the Madonna. Yeah. I know, you always feel like a rock star when you have the, <laughs> the Madonna here, so. Okay. Our colleagues, oh, going to make sure we're turned on here for our, our audience. Uh, Jim, thank you so much. So for the record, you can always say something interesting at GMF and you can always make news at GMF. So I hope that is a, an entree. Are you entree. suggesting I didn't? Oh, you did. We're gonna, we're gonna unpack that a little bit. Uh, but, but Jim, <laughs> thank you so much uh, for your, your clarity, your conviction, uh, the message of strength came through. Uh, and I would say just summarizing what I just heard, your 2024 priorities, it's, it's an Eastern priority, uh, whether that's uh, Ukraine, Eurasia, the Black Sea region, the Western Balkans. And you know it's a priority on making some deep future investments in allied competitiveness, whether that's in the energy transition, uh, the technological revolution. Um, so I think those were very, very important messages. So um, the moderator's prerogative. I'm going to walk you through what is some questions that I have, and then and integrate some questions that we took uh, before when we announced the event from uh, from our audience. And then I want to welcome everybody uh, into this conversation with with Jim. So let me begin with Ukraine, and I want to play a bit of devil's advocate because uh, Congress has been working on this supplemental for weeks and weeks and weeks. The EU has been working on their. Uh, supplemental support for Ukraine for, for months. Uh, I, I was in Berlin in midsummer when Ursula von der Leyen announced the 50 billion euro package. So this has been in the making. Uh, the longer this drags out, uh, Ukraine needs macroeconomic support by March. They are starved for ammunition. The longer this drags out, and we don't have that knowledge, are we starting to form a plan B here? 
what if the supplemental doesn't come in a timely way, if the EU doesn't come, what's the next plan? Is it declaring a national emergency? Does the executive branch have some tools? What's the plan? I'm going to resist the temptation to speculate on okay. plan B, okay. because I think we are going to secure plan okay. A. And two reasons. One is in the EU, and because we're all policy nerds being here, so the EU has the option to secure its funding either collectively, Michael can correct me, um, at 27, or the other 26 can go forward on their own. So there is very little leverage from the one holdout, except maybe to affect some of what he might want his country to pay for. And I think that's a very strong position. And given the resolute support we see both from the council and the commission, I feel com very confident. And again, I've um, testified and briefed many members in the House and the Senate. The support for Ukraine is overwhelming. The choice for us is um, you hear in public that there are multiple crises and they must all be addressed. The supplemental request is to cover humanitarian issues globally, um, support Israel, support Taiwan, support Ukraine. And Republicans have said they need to see progress on the border as well. I think there's been exceptional progress. They need to decide whether all of these things get decided at one time or we can actually address these emergencies on an urgent time scale because we've been calling them emergencies that cannot be delayed for more than two months. And I just think this is kind of normal for the United States. Um, and I'm struck by, in 1941, so I'm gonna do old guy stuff because all suburban dads are always studying either the Roman Empire or World War II. But in 1941, in the summer of 41, the US had a legislative mandate to reduce our army by about two thirds to 75%. And President Roosevelt had campaigned, you know, sort of vigorously, just coming off his third reelection. He campaigned hard to say, yeah, we need to get rid of this requirement. Europe is occupied by Germany. Japan is threatening supply lines in, in the Pacific. Like we can't disarm. He failed utterly. And what ended up happening was that the Speaker of the House stepped down from his lectern for a time, went into the cloakroom, and managed to secure enough votes from his own caucus and from the other party for the, the legislation to be overturned by one vote. And if that legislation had not been rescinded, the US would have gone into Pearl Harbor Day with an army three quarters smaller than the already inadequate force that we have. Now, that Speaker of the House has a building named after him in the congressional complex on the Hill. So it's a moment for leaders to say, we recognize what's urgent to make decisions and to go ahead and get things done that will make America safer and more prosperous going forward. And the question is whether we currently have the leaders today to meet that moment. Let me talk a little bit about you, the Ukrainian military strategy. And just to quote you, you, you mentioned this is a realistic military strategy for 2024, which I don't want to pierce this, but sort of speaks to, was 2023 an unrealistic strategy? Did we have unrealistic expectations for the counteroffensive? You're starting to hear the expert community talk about aggressive defense for Ukraine, having that very defensive posture hold the line as best they can in 2024 to maybe hope for industrial production to kick in in 2025. Is that sort of part of the... Uh, keep Ukraine strong in 2024 strategy? Is that where we're thinking of moving forward? Or are we in lockstep with the Ukrainians on that strategy? There are actual experts working on exactly what the, the military strategy should be. I'd say in general, I think like any strategy, you have to identify your strengths, pick those and bet on them. Yeah. Um, and obviously 2023, there's public discussion about you know whether all the right choices were made. I think that's one of our strengths that we can have this discussion. I think we're also recognizing that this is a war that is in some cases kind of like the trench warfare of World War I, but also a little bit like a sci-fi movie um, with the advances in the use of unmanned vehicles, artificial intelligence for targeting and so on. And taking lessons from that is incredibly important. So the strength of the Russian defensive lines last year really came from their absorption of some of these new technologies. They could lay thousands of mines overnight 
so that rather than an opening, you know, you, you, you had things closed. And now we're coming to a different kind of warfare. And I just to pull out of the discussion of, of exactly what Ukraine will do this year, I, I think this is um, this makes Ukraine an enormous contributor to our security because they have the most experience at fighting the war that is coming. And, and I think the conversations that we have with Ukraine as we head into the NATO summit reflect that sense that they are not simply a recipient of a lot of assistance and advice, but that they have learned things that are important for all of us. And that will be a piece of their strategy through the year. Let me transition a little bit as we look ahead to the July NATO summit. What are the key themes in your mind? What does success look like? Yeah, I think the... Um, the key thing is to celebrate how remarkable an alliance this is. So we will be 32 by that time. Um, it, we will have very strong regional defense plans put in place. Uh, they'll all be executable. We have allies, more than 20 will be at or above 2% in defense spending of their GDP with cracks for most of the rest. When you compare that to 10 years ago when the 2% pledge was made in Wales, it is a remarkable achievement. Foreign Minister Cameron mentioned the Prime Minister when that was declared. And he said one of the ways, some, some things strike him as more of the same as when he was last in government. Some things are remarkable change. This is remarkable change, the kind of commitment to reinvestment in, in NATO going forward. So we'll capture all of that. But then it's really about preparing for the future. We need to defend our futures. And that means more work in the regions that may have been underserved in recent years. Um, it means more practical work about preparing our defense industrial base so that it can fight the wars that we're seeing come. Um, and then it's uh, having a clear relationship with Ukraine so that Ukraine knows it is included in the, the family while it works on the reforms it needs to make. Um, and prepares its future as well. So I think that's what would, would constitute success this summer. What's the message to the American people about NATO? They're hearing NATO is essential to America's security. They are hearing um, that it uh, does not serve America's interest. The summit will happen a few days before the Republican National Convention. What is the message to the American people? I, I think the message is never before as a country stood with so many strong allies capable of reaching across the region that is most important to our economic health. And if someone wants to throw that away, I think it's a serious question about their sense of, of what makes America strong. So the what people will see are a set of 32 allies. They'll see um, the partnerships that extend through to the um, Pacific and to the islands of the, of the Pacific, that where we're able to help people secure their territorial integrity and their freedom. And all of that goes to, in crass terms, the factories we buy from, the shipping lanes we rely upon, the businesses we invest in, um, the people we sell to. So just in simple terms, this is about protecting the freedom, the prosperity of Americans. We've never had something as strong and broad a base to do that from. Jim, I want to just sort of finish up on the speech, and then I want to uh, open the conversation a little bit broader from the conversation. I want to pull on the Western Western Balkans. Um, U.S. policy towards the Western Balkans has very much always been to support EU integration. That was certainly the case of the last 15 years. That didn't produce the results, as you clearly stated. Now, uh, full support uh, with the growth plan. But I have to say, as I've watched this region Sometimes the U.S. choice has been stability of the region and not the reform agenda. And when I speak of reforms, I think about democratic reforms. I'm thinking about Serbia's election and the challenge. And, uh, you know, many inter international observers are calling for that. Do we have to choose between reform and stability? You've set out a clear path of reform is the way. But we all have to, that reform may come with instability as well as we anti-corruption and free media and strong civil society. Do we have the balance right? Because I feel like we don't have the right balance well, right now. This is the question I ask myself every day. And some of it is you have to work your way through processes that work at different paces. So disruptors can function like that. 
um, building stability takes time. And, and so there's a balance between immediacy and patience that really matters. So we look at the Serbian election, and I think we still don't know whether there will be a government in Belgrade from this election. International observers actually didn't look at that election. So finding the evidence of what happened in Belgrade is something that's you know, building over time. Um, but we'll see whether there's a, um, a government that's formed. But at the parliamentary level, the opposition parties emerged with 200,000 more votes and many more parliamentarians than they had had before. And in many areas, that's a mark of a place that is allowing some kind of a different way forward. The challenge, and I, I tried to say this publicly, and I think I didn't do it very well, the challenge going forward is who's going to be able to promise delivery for the people of Serbia. And I think one way we often, our discussions in Washington get a little bit skewed is that in the current alignment of the region, Serbia does pretty well by investment and economic standards. So if we keep things as they are, we're essentially having a situation where Serbia, the incomes in Serbia keep going up. The growth in Serbia keeps going up. More high value investment goes into Serbia. And if we want the other states and the people in those other states to have the same opportunity, we have to encourage reform, even at the risk of some instability. Now, the lure of being able to participate in higher value industries and to participate in higher growth opportunities is a really important immediate one for political leaders in those uh, countries, particularly, I would say, I think in Serbia, but in, in other countries. And so to my mind, that is a place where there's a converging interest that promotes both reform and the stability of the region. Now, there are other kinds of reforms that um, are a little more adversarial with leaders across the region. And there are a set of leaders Particularly, I'll say, I see the ambassador from Bosnia here. I, I think, you know, in, in Bosnia Herzegovina, there are some leaders who, frankly, benefit from more instability. And reform there is going to oppose the kinds of practices that, that Mr. Dodik and others advocate. I'll talk more about that next week. But, but so the balance is a little different each place. But for the region as a whole to have a path to move forward, on issues where all the leaders acknowledge that they have to do better, that's a real change from, I think, say, four or five years ago. And, and I don't want us to miss that window, which is kind of unique to now, as opposed to where we were before the pandemic. Well, Jim, I could say your strong leadership in this region, I think more U.S. attention will be absolutely vital, and we look forward to, to next week and learning more. Before I turn uh, over to the audience for questions, let me talk about the other elephant in the room. You did mention the supplemental is the elephant. The, let's talk about the U.S. election outcome as the elephant in this room. We heard today Manfred Weber, uh, head of the European People's Party, suggests that Europe, you know, the U.S. is no longer uh, going to be able to defend Europe against Russia in a scenario with our elections, talking about rethinking the nuclear umbrella, missile defense shield. Um, we also have a funny, I will call this the new transatlanticism. It's almost an anti-transatlanticism where you have Prime Minister Orban, Fidesz party, working with elements of the Republican party, sort of against a strong transatlantic agenda. How do, what's the answer? To, to this, how do we, uh, you know, how do we help our European colleagues understand the stability, the strength that you've outlined, when it feels so precarious and our politics aren't bipartisan enough to sustain this strong security alliance? I, I'm looking to help help me answer the questions that I get every day, that you get every day. How do you help our European colleagues manage through the next ten months? Help me, please. I, I haven't gotten my Hatch Act briefing yet. Oh dear. Um, well, I don't mean to put you in a, I don't no, mean no, to put no. in a no, bad but I, situation. I, so let me but... try to. But this is the question that I get from Michael and from colleagues in Brussels all the time. I think there are a couple things. One is it is helpful to explain our system to them and a bit of our history, because people see a headline, polls. New York Times says this is going one way. Therefore, I, that's what I have to work. I think 
first, as I indicated with my earlier Sam Rayburn story, we've been here before. And as Churchill said, we do tend to pick the right option after we explore all the others. So, so a little bit of calm, but then understanding our system and looking at the actual results and actual elections recently, I think gives you a much different picture than just horse race polls and um, uh, you know op-eds. So well, some of it is just explaining that this the situation is, looks a bit different from inside than from outside. By the way, that's a lesson American diplomats are always trying to remind ourselves of when we go to tell somebody else how to live their lives. But that's um, it's important in this case, and this is the reverse transatlanticism. Like sometimes we need to heal ourselves um, while we're we're talking with others. The in that context, so where it's actually a bit more open, I think the a couple of other themes that are are relevant. We're building institutions. And having those institutions be of clear benefit to each country is really important. So you mentioned there's one European country that seems to be sort of looking to veto or be the last one to say yes on multiple significant issues. But I think the bedrock approach that many people take in dealing with that country is that it recognizes that being in is a lot better for it than being out. And so at the the end of each negotiation, you're trying to present them with a simple choice. You're in, you're out. And that gives a lot of leverage to those who are on the inside. And I think the same discussion will happen with us. And I realize I'm being somewhat vague for you know to try to be sensitive to, to things. But I, I think if we look at, say, a NATO, we just need to be able to say others are sharing the burden. Others are taking risk. Others are preparing properly for what goes forward. So the items I mentioned, defense funding, uh, funding um, uh, identif or securing the right regional defense plans and building the defense industrial base that will supply the weapons needed to carry them out, all of those mean that when someone reports to office on the first day of a new administration and they look and say, well, if I try to go it alone, I'll have to spend this much more and these people will be doing things that are destabilizing. It's clearly much better if we're together. So, so showing the mutual benefit, I think, is important. Um, and then the final piece is to have responsible governments do real things that people see. Now, let's give one illustration that, that I was you know, kind of on the margins of. Um, we had a situation this last fall where Romania and Bulgaria had qualified, clearly, to be in Schengen. But the problem was that um, you know, there were migrants moving through their societies, so they were being blocked. And in turn, they were blocking that other country from, you know, Austria in this case, from achieving, uh, from, from taking up certain roles. And that was affecting American interests as well. What they ended up doing was saying, we need to find a way, because all three governments are facing challenges from right-wing populism, kind of anti-immigrant immigrant, um, politicians. So one temptation would be to demonstrate that each one of them could be tougher on the migrants than the other one. And that's a kind of self-defeating cycle of escalation that wouldn't have produced good results and would have left the political debate sort of still sitting and frankly would have left Romanian and Bulgarian citizens without Schengen access to Europe. So everybody loses. And we know that chasing the right wing on its issues just kind of buys you more. And instead, what they did was come together and work out a step-by-step -step process where starting next month, no, March, beginning of March, so end of next month, the, there will be access through certain ports of entry on Schengen basis, and then there'll be something else. And this has changed fundamentally the politics of the issue because people see responsible politicians are delivering. And I just think we have to look at each issue and come up with the compromises, the ways forward that we can. And it shows people are delivering on things that matter and they're sharing the burden of taking it forward. And I think that lets everyone know that you're better off working inside in these institutions than outside. My prescription is remain calm, self-reliance, um, and keep speaking to the American people about the value of our allies. So we have a, a couple minutes here. I'd love to take a question from the right side and a question from the left side. 
and let you respond to those, and then we'll let okay. you get back to the State Department if that sounds like a plan here. So, All except the last part sounds good. So, uh, uh, well, <laughs> if you'd like to stay, we'd love to have you. We'll put you to work here at GMF. Okay, so I have a, a question back there. A microphone is coming your way. Please introduce yourself and keep the question crisp and then getting ready over here. Okay, yeah, yeah we'll turn to you. Yes, sir, please. Good morning. Uh, my name is oh. Arthur Pichadowski, and I'm a sociologist, I can look at the bigger picture of, of uh, the framework that, that you put so much effort into. Uh, and uh, I, I think my question, my question is, is uh, you mentioned words like leadership, values, uh, tell someone else how to do their work. You also mentioned institution building. And my question relates to hearts and minds as you build these international institutions. Uh, because right now, if you listen to the press, if you read in the media, the biggest criticism of American foreign policy is this idea of selective morality. Uh, what kind of morality is it? Is it an across the board morality? And it seems like the hearts and minds of the world have not been occupied by some sort of vision. And uh, that, that, that's where I just want to finish up with my question. There's this idea of uh, the moral imperative, right? And uh, the moral imperative is this idea of uh, partnerships, right? Uh, par arrangements. Yeah. Is there a clear vision for the world that America is offering as it's so busy doing all of these daily things, right? A clear vision that would take away all of this work because people would believe in you in our country. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna put a slight twist on that. Winning hearts and minds in an era of information manipulation yeah. and disinformation, because I think that the moral imperative, how do you even pro provide that when it is so skewed in uh, Joseph uh, Burrell has noted this, the EU elections, our elections, we're doing a lot of work on AI and deep fakes and yeah. that. So I'd love your comment on that. Yeah, I'll have the microphone right there and then we'll, Jim, have you respond, please. Yeah, I'm Eldon Mishula from the Voice of America. You carefully navigated the Black Sea without mentioning it. <laughs> um, Russia is building a military base in occupied Abkhazia. And when we talk about the Black Sea security, Georgia is a uh, country that also contributes to it. Uh, where do you see Georgia in this context, in the larger context of the Black Sea security, as we also keep in mind the Russian Black Sea fleet that can no longer stay safe and secure? Thanks, Jim. Um, so our ambassador to Georgia was with me in Romania as we discussed these issues. And we see Georgia as a critical security partner um, for the Black Sea. The, um, if we look at, and I remember you talking to me about the Black Sea a long time ago, and I sort of half listened, but um, the, 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 if we look at what's about to happen, so the Central Asian states are looking for trade routes that aren't just China or Russia. And they built a lot of their infrastructure to go through Russia, now they wanna build different infrastructure. That means it flows down across the Caspian, Azerbaijan, then it goes to Georgia, or what we hope will be uh, an arrangement with Armenia and Turkey so that it flows out as well that way, both routes to handle huge volumes of trade. And we're looking at the Black Sea then managing even more of the global trade in key you know, critical minerals, grain, all kinds of, of items. We'll do some work again with the EU because this is a foundational partnership so we'll have work with the EU on promoting exactly this. There's a conference next week in Brussels about financing some of these, these trade opportunities. Um, it's hosted by EIB, EBRD, I think EBRD, and then we'll participate. So, so this is really important. And the Black Sea will end up with uh, LNG connections between Georgia um, and Romania. It'll end up with a number of undersea cables for electricity, communications, and so on. Um, uh, off-sea gas production from off Turkey, off of uh, Romania, uh, potentially off other countries. So it's going to become a dense area of economic involvement, even beyond what it was before. We need to make sure that's protected. And we need to make sure that the rules of engagement across that wide range of countries are pretty clear to everyone, including to Russia. And then we'll do that with Georgia. In Georgia itself, you've got these very important parliamentary elections this year, and we've strongly supported the International Observer Mission. We're going to be working with that mission and, frankly, with the um, really vibrant civil society in Georgia 
to see that that the election goes well. Because what we know is more than 85% of citizens of Georgia continually say what they want is reform and entry into the EU. That's who we have to stand with. Now, the Georgian government has really put in an effort at reform measures, particularly over the last months. And we appreciate what they've done. We appreciate what they've done on um, avoiding sanction circumvention by restricting a lot of activity. I, I think there's room to have a lot of, of optimism that Georgia will be a key contributor in that, that environment. Now, we know Russia is investing a lot in its uh, own port, Novorossiysk. It's investing in the, or it's taken over a number of Ukrainian ports and is attempting to use them. And as you say, it's building our um, infrastructure in Abkhazia. So this will be something we have to work our way through over the next years, but we'll get our way through it because that's 10 countries who just want more peace and prosperity um, from having a secure arrangement in the Black Sea. And that's the thing we'll work on coming up. Now, um, I, I'm fascinated by being an institutional sociologist. I find, you know, I don't even know what that quite means, but everybody from Weber through Bordeaux, Giddens and others, I think are some of the most interesting thinkers about how you move a society from one place to another. So I'm really jealous. The, um, the, the piece of this though, I, so I'll address this in more prosaic terms. Right? One of them was in my list of attributes I look for, a key one was listening and understanding that other people have advice to give us at times. And I may have glossed over that from time to time, but I think that is a uh, that that bit of humility and curiosity is crucial, especially when you're in a moment of respecting our partners for doing more and asking them to do much more. So so that is a big element that I don't want to have lost in any any list of how we we set about um, building these institutions. But I think there are a couple of themes that that both you and and Heather mentioned. So one of them is we have to acknowledge the values and institutions we care about, even when we are having difficulty seeing them fully embodied in practice. So you can certainly see in what the president and secretary say about the situation in Gaza, which is a risk in Europe, right? It divides the polities of many European countries. Um, and unlike the invasion of, of Ukraine, it runs dividing us. But we are very clear that what we want to see is more and adequate humanitarian relief in Gaza, conditions of life that allow people to start to rebuild, um, less violence in any way, but also a very real security answer. I mean, Hamas is a neo, uh, it's an anti-Semitic, uh, you know, death cult that is trying to destroy Israel. It's not trying to build a better life uh, for anyone. And Israel has a real security concern that has to be addressed at the, the base of it. But we've been saying more pauses, get the hostages out, get the humanitarian aid in, begin to help with the rebuilding, prepare for what comes afterward in a way that can protect the security of Israel and the states around there, but also allow people of Gaza and of the West Bank to, to rebuild. Now, that's a message that, that seems faint when we see the news every day. But part of the choice we all have to make, and Heather's had to make this as well. I don't want to loop you into that, this, but but it it you choose your inside or you're out. And if you're inside, then you have to show up every day and just keep going at it. And we have to keep saying that the values we are trying to see reflected here are the ones we uphold. And if we strengthen those values and institutions in Ukraine, that will be to the benefit of situations like what we see in the Middle East. So you don't give up. You just keep doing it every single day. Now, to how that affects hearts and minds, we do, just as a, a, a very practical level, we have a real problem. Our societies are open. We have built, uh, we have allowed to be built information technologies that let people select what information they get, but also allow their information streams to be polluted, frankly, by people who seek to manipulate them, to induce anger rather than engagement. And, and that's a real problem that, that we've got in our societies. So one thing we are doing is working closely, with, again, with our EU colleagues, with a lot of member states, at addressing specific issues that are likely to come up across the European information space um, to try to make sure that we're providing accurate, at times, you know, views that are in our interest, but also accurate information um, and that hopefully get people out of this 
short-term uh, endorphin hit of, hey, I get to be angry alone here in my room a little bit longer and out into thinking about how do we make this world better as we go forward. And this is the challenge. And since my last answer, I'll just say this is the challenge for this year. You know, we are coming to a period where the European level institutions after April, they'll be in a bit of a hiatus heading into elections in June and then commission formation in the fall. Um, many member states, I think there's what, what is it? It's 10 member states have elections this year. And um, so, you know, that I've got, aware I've, uh, yeah, that's right. There may be some Sometimes others, things you know, there, the, you know, 50 countries and already a huge percentage of them are, are heading into um, fairly contested elections. And um, during that period, the, the, the race will be to have clear policy lines so that those of us who work during transitions are able to continue delivering results, even while we're waiting for the new government to come in place. So these next couple months are really critical. That's why adoption of the growth plan is really critical, because we can do the work as long as the political signal is there. Um, similarly, with disinformation, if we have a strong initiative to address the underlying causes and to put out correct information, we can do that work through the election period. If we sort of fumble around for two or three months right now, we'll miss that window and we could lose the whole year. So the challenge for me is to get the first quarter as the base from which we can leap into the rest of the year. Yeah, thanks, Jim. I mean, I, this is a great way to, to end the conversation because, you know, it's really no excuses, do the work. Every day, we have to build our democracy, make sure that democracy delivers make sure that prosperity is secure, our democracies are secure. I have to say, when we had the title of this event, I, I sort of quarreled with it a little bit because Europe, whole and free, it just feels tired to me. It feels like we've been saying that and it feels like it's taken too long, but the march from 1989 eastward never ended. Your work, my work, our collective work. That's what we have to do every single day. It's that march forward. That's what your your priorities told me. That's uh, in, in light of and in spite of this incredibly unstable political moment for all of us. We just have to take a step every day forward. No excuses. We all have to do the work. Uh, and I just to say, I now suddenly find myself an old guy. You're not and the, guy, but by the, the way, I started work at the State Department the day before Halloween, 1989. Trick or treat. So 10 days before the fall of the Berlin Wall. So at that point, the line that Churchill saw, right, Staten on the Baltic to Trieste on the Adriatic, was still roughly the line of some kind. You know, it had changed. It was more permeable, but it was there. That line's erased. We don't want to draw a new line. Somebody else wants to draw a new line. It's going to be in a much different place and a lot further to the east. And that's a pretty remarkable accomplishment for one generation of policy. So my task is to let's make sure we hold and build on that uh, over the next years. But you can't let despair over immediate problems keep you from building out that, that vision. Well, on behalf of GMF, we are building right there with you, my friend. This was an amazing hour of conversation. Thank you so much, Jim, and for your incredible team for making this possible. Thank you all for joining us as well as our online viewers with your warm applause. Please thank Jim O'Brien for a great conversation.